lines is a major compositional tool or his theme. Straight lines, J shapes, S shapes. Very rare, very hard to do. Not rare, but hard to do. Very common, very powerful compositional tool, J shapes. S shapes, very sensual, very sensuous, very sexy kind of thing. Two straight line. Okay. But you, you skew it. So it makes it more interesting rather than just going straight up and down. So this is what I saw. I'm like, oh, well, I need to skew it a little bit. Here's one of Aho Blooming. Again, but it's just a straight line. J shapes. Most flowers, blooming flowers, have J shapes. Do that one more time. If you look at flowers all closely, they all have this nice sinuous shape to them. And then S shapes. Streams. Maybe at least some streams in Illinois have S shapes. You saw earlier, some of them don't. You know, there's a nice sinuous S shape. There's one. <coughs> what drew me to the photo was that, not that it was a great blue heron, but that it was in this orientation. Okay, and then we got repetition of form, shapes, radial symmetry. All this is in your handout. Repetition of form, shapes, radial symmetry. Repetition of form. It's a photo of what? This, I got it. Okay. Repeating forms, very, very interesting. You do it well. Repeating forms. Repeating forms. Okay. Repeating forms with parallel lines with the law of thirds. So that one takes three compositional elements and puts them together. Right? You got shapes. You got repetition of form. You got lines. You even got chaos going on. Okay. Here's one with shapes. Here's the shape. This is the shape. And here's the intrusive element. There's a law of thirds. You see how this works? You just keep building. And if you've got ten different compositional things in your mind, you combine them and ten to the umpteen to how many million organisms there are, you've got infinite possibilities for organizing a photo that's never been organized that way before, and yet you still have a finite number of things in your brain to remember. Shape, shape, shape. Third, third, third. Diagonal, no, not, not straight across. All those things you do by positioning where you choose to take the photo. This is the same photo, exactly the same photo as that one at the prairie. Okay. Radial symmetry. Radial symmetry is hard to do when you're square, but. You do it. Usually, if you position things off center, it's nice if there was something here, but there isn't, so do what you do. And then you begin combining them. And as you, as you learn to take photographs, you, you learn to combine things. You learn to, to look at things, and you need to apply the things you knew to achieve what you want. You see all the backgrounds in all those flowers? What were they? They weren't there. How did they not end up there? Anybody ever taken photos? We got all this crap in the background. Like, what is that? You have anything? You can get rid of that, and not with a weed whacker or machete. Where'd the background go? It's a hackberry tree. For God's sake, and a forest. Where's the forest? Okay, lines, shapes. I'm not sure how to do all that. Chaos, intrusive elements, law of thirds. Same photo, but this one has an intrusive element. This is much more interesting than the previous one, because it has this dead American, uh, American uh, white birch in it. All right, and my favorite, the most powerful compositional tool is you, you already have in you, and you, you were born with it. Tell a kid to draw a tree. There's a, you're, the, go out here in the museum, downstairs in the, in the kid's play area, what are your trees, David? Or David, Michael? What are your trees shaped like? Lollipop. 
lollipops. Popsicles. Lollipops. Right. You tell a kid to draw a tree, you get a stick and a green thing. Flower. You get a lollipopsicle. Draw some grass. Okay. They don't have any inhibitions about simplifying things, making it very simple. Not simplistic, but simple. So simplification is a very, very powerful compositional tool for you as photographers. Let me go out next next time. We're going to ask you to do some of these things. We're going to ask you to find these things in the environment. Very, very simple. Three ovals, and that's all it is. It's three ovals, and you pick that out of the environment. So I was talking about photographing turtles on the way in over here. There are opportunities, okay? Everybody takes a turtle, you know, see the turtles. There are opportunities to do it in extraordinary ways. Tree frogs, you know, you don't need the whole swamp to portray the frog. All you need is the frog in the tree. To do a cormorant, all you need is, well, remember, all the Leopold Spear screen fire in the eyes of a dying wolf? Looks like it's here too. In the eyes of a live cormorant. Sonoran Desert. What could be simpler than that? You know you're in the Sonoran Desert. You don't need anything else. Okay? You don't need anything else. And you know what's in the rainy season, but look at the sky. Okay? Alright. So methods for simplification. Isolate the subject. How do you isolate the subject? There it is. All by itself. In its own little studio, you know? Crawling up a limb out, out in the desert. Here's one of Sue's, the chuck wall. Where is it? I don't know. It's in the Sonora Desert, but it's isolated from its background and becomes the entire subject. You turn over a leaf. Oh my God, what's going on under the leaf? You've got stink bugs. From here to here, it's about half an inch. When things happen small. We'll talk about getting close to subjects. So if you know something about stink bug eggs, you know, and that's probably something that hasn't occurred to anybody. <laughs> stink bug eggs, they always occur in multiples of seven. So every, you throw a relief, you see stink bug eggs look like little barrels. You count them, there'll be seven, 14, 21, so what do One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14. Inevitable. I've never seen one that wasn't a multiple seven. We don't know how, why. Maybe they can count. Maybe they can only count to 14. Portraying intimate landscapes. The probably the most famous landscape photographer of all time was Elliot Porter. Uh, and he made, made his reputation and living by, by portraying small pieces of the habitat that are representative of the whole. That's another way of, of we'll bringing a book next time with Elliot Porter to show what we're talking about. There's a frog pond, a, a, a toad pond in mating season during an plexus. You don't need to show the whole thing to show what's going on. So the hair and mercury in southern Illinois, you don't need to show the whole forest to show what's going on. And now you know where the two lines are, you know, all those sorts of things. Just thousands and thousands of, of gulls down on Red Lake. You don't have to show all of them. You, know, you got diagonal lines, you got to show what's going on. And finally, number one, reducing contrast. How many of you would go a really good day for pictures? Look out the window there. What do you see? You see sunlight. You see darks and lights, darks and lights, darks and lights. That's contrast. Your camera does not like contrast. Anybody ever seen a, a sun dappled woods in the, walking around? It's beautiful with your eye. You take a picture of it. What? That's not what I saw. It's simply because there's too much contrast between the dark and the light the camera can't deal with. Now, digital is better than film used to be, but it's still not very good. All right, so how do you reduce contrast? Sue and I were making, in Texas, whipping down the road, saw this along the roadside, got out, took a snapshot, windy, what is it, 60 mile hour, winds blowing, these things going back and forth. And I'm like, how do you reduce contrast? Anybody ever been to a photo studio? Have your picture taken? No, never? In high school, you never? They put these big lights on you, and what is in front of those lights? 
vision <coughs> screens, something to cut the light down, to cut the contrast. And what do we call those in nature? Clouds. Clouds. Okay. Or, so that's the image that you got versus yellow. See the difference between the, con like the contrast? What is the difference? The only difference is, oh, I don't have my picture. I, I had Sue with a diffusion screen holding in the wind. Not happy. But, <laughs> but we'll talk about how to do how to do that later. All right. Blooming cactus. Oh wow, that's a cool image. Look at it. If you put cloud cover over it, more information there. Less contrast. A much more color saturated, much more pleasing image than that. Than that. Better. Okay. So, how do you carry diffusion screens? We'll, we'll, we'll show you how to do that. Yeah. All right. So carry your cloud. Oh, there she is. I knew she was in there somewhere. <laughs> See how happy she is? <laughs> <laughs> what is the material? Huh? What is the material? It's it's a uh, it's a translucent. You know, white umbrellas. That you take, that you buy anywhere. Yeah, right. Yeah. Why not umbrella, man? Theoretically, yeah. Until I started teaching this class, you should be able to buy these everywhere. Uh, it's basically any, any white fabric that's translucent will function as a diffusion screen. Now you can buy these from the photos for a hundred bucks, or you can you can get an umbrella, white umbrella for nine bucks, and do the same thing. Whatever. Except as soon as we started saying this, they stopped making white umbrellas. <laughs> you used to be able to go to Walmart and be a whole thing umbrellas and have them with your white. It's not popular. Now they're all black, polka dot, and green. If you use a green one, you're going to get green light. If you use the polka dot one, you're going to get, you know, so. Gray and white are, are good, but so if you ever see a white umbrella, buy it. So there's, there's the difference between, that's what difference this made between that and that. Okay. To, to conclude here, it's all about perception, okay? You see an image, you see an opportunity for an image, and you take it. And you make it. So I'm giving you all these templates, you know, and, and, and in your get in here. Yeah. I've given you a little card that has all these templates on it. You can put that in your little pocket. If you can't remember what I'm talking about, take them along with you. Okay? Just, just suggestions, just ideas, some things to look for. So, you got perception, you see a photograph of the and you say, oh yeah, I know how to treat, I know how to create that. I've done it before. We call that photographic deja vu. I've seen that, and I've seen that I can do that. Let me show you. If you thought you saw this photo earlier, and you saw the, the absolute same photograph compositionally, it's the same. Now, the, the lenses and the conditions were different, but in my mind, that's the same. Oh, that's a good photo. That's a good option, right? But you reverse that, they're, they're identical. Okay? They're identical. So that's having this mental template of things that you can draw from quickly. The same thing. With Jay shape, you know, but it's the, all three of those photos in my brain were exactly the same. So as you progress photographically, uh, you grow. Somebody read this? Visual elegance. Visual elegance. Somebody read this. Visual elegance. And somebody read this. Yeah. <laughs> Simply by changing the font, you change the, you change the mood of a photo. Okay? So, good photo, you know, you want to sue, better photo, you know, you want to be better, and then you get very, very elegant. So very different moods from those three images. That's what I mean by, by working images. 
Okay. That's a photo of a. It would be suitable for a field guy. Would I hang that on my wall? Yeah. But I think this one is a much more visually elegant, much more visually pleasing image. You probably wouldn't put that in the field guide, but I would hang that one on my wall. Okay. And you would, you want to get somebody interested in, in prairies and, oh, look, that's, you know, they got blue stand, I mean, they got little blue stand, they got just a more interesting photo. In Africa, when every morning we would wake, we woke up to this baboon troop. You know, I, I did the best I could, you know. I, I, and then one evening, I, I, I got up just at sunrise or sunset, and I was looking around, I got a much more visually elegant view of the same yeah. troop. Right? Same thing, same everything, except different. A little bit different. All right. How do you learn to compose photographs? How do you do it? We take pictures. All right. How do you learn to compose photographs with images when you don't have a lot of time? You practice. How do you practice composition? Well, I don't know if you've all seen these or not. This is, this is not a picture frame in your thing. This is a compositional frame for practicing your you know, When you're out walking and doing your treasures of nature activity, take this along with you. This is your camera format. All right. Wide angle. Tell photo. Horizontal, vertical. What's what's good kind of, You can tell, you can look through here, what's pleasing. And then once you do that on the subject, then, then your mental process begins is okay, I have this vision of this image. How do I make my camera take that image? If you can't just point it at it and, and assume it will take the image that's in your brain because it won't. It will not. It will not take the image that you've got in your brain unless it's blind, dumb luck. Okay. If everything it thinks corresponds with everything you think, then you have this opportunity. Okay? So the rest of the course is going to be about allowing you to manipulate. You need to just, you know, I know you look. People going around doing dumb things. 